Bill Cosby. <laughs> you know, I'm uh, I'm pretty sure they could probably dig up a few over there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, in a statement today, Wilshire Police said Heath, who was prime minister under the conservative government between 1970 and 1974, lived in the city of Salisbury in the county of Wiltshire for many years. He died there at age 89. It is uh, said I wanted, uh, no, it said it wanted anyone with information, of course, to contact the officers and is working closely with the children's charity to ensure any possible victims are supported. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. If there is evidence of offenses having been committed, we will ensure that, if possible, those responsible are held account accountable through a thorough and detailed investigation. This includes any other parties who are identified as having been involved in child sex abuse, the police force added. Well, I would say if it's the deceased Mr. Heath, you're too damn late. <laughs> Well, Sir Edward Heath Charitable Foundation, which runs a museum at Heath's former home in Salisbury, says it welcomes the investigation, the BBC reported. We wholeheartedly believe it will clear Sir Edward's name and we will cooperate fully with the police in their inquiries, a foundation spokesman said, according to the broadcaster. The investigation is the latest in relation to a string of allegations of historic child sex abuse involving high-profile figures in Britain. In May, the National Police Chiefs Council, the NPCC, a group that operates across Britain's forces, announced that more than 1,400 suspects, including 76 politicians and dozens of celebrities, are being investigated over allegations of child sex abuse involving VIPs and in institutions such as schools. In March, the IPCC said it will investigate allegations of corruption in Scotland Yard itself relating to child sex offenses allegedly involving members of parliament and police officers. Oh, bloody fun! <laughs> <laughs> I say, had that eight-year-old quite wrapped up. Yes. <laughs> oh, jolly good. They get f***ing crazy because all of a sudden nobody loves them. A cheerio! <laughs> Damn it, number one, it's an anomaly. <laughs> Wesley. <laughs> uh, yes, and for you folks who maybe don't know, that's a reference to the one, the only Wesley Crusher of Star Trek, The Next Generation. <laughs> Wesley, come sit by the captain. <laughs> Oh, there you go, Gilbert. I bet you that's a that's a, an impersonation you can't do. You cannot do Patrick Stewart. Yeah. Uh, I bet you. You know, I'm the most talented guy in this room. Uh, not when it comes to the great Sir Patrick Stew. Awful. It's not awful, but but just not good. Right. Right. <laughs> <clears throat> My film, Unrepented, did very well in Europe. Yes, 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 uh, it did. Uh, I'm sure all the uh, pedophiles loved your film. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Actually, now that I think about it, Unrepentant, that was the film, uh, 2009, I know, because I worked on it with you. Yes. Um, <laughs> that that film, if I remember correctly, Unrepentant, that, that's the one about the, uh, the Roman Catholic Church uh, coming over and raping all the Indians in Canada. Right. <laughs> Bloody good show, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> well, moving on today, we got some archaeological finds in the news. Yes, yes, the archaeologists have found the gate to Goliath's hometown. No word on David. Yes. <laughs> An archaeological dig, now on its 20th year, has uh, uncovered the entrance gate to Gath, the ancient biblical city of the Pal uh, Philistines, and one-time home of the giant Goliath before the king of Damascus destroyed it in 830 BC. Gath was the largest city in the land for hundreds of years, reports the Jerusalem Post. The Bible refers to the massive city gate itself in the story of David's escape from King Saul to the king of Gath. In addition to the city gate, scientists have also unearthed an impressive fortification wall and several stargates. <laughs> 
Several other buildings include a temple and an iron production facility and what the Post calls the earliest decipherable Philistine inscription ever found, which contains two names similar to Goliath, but one that's very similar to Crash Jesus. <laughs> Well, after finding a huge fortification, it's clearly the most important city of the 10th and 9th century, says the archaeologist in charge of the dig, per I-24. The long-term dig is part of the Ackerman family bar Leon University expedition to Gath. A look at the archaeology and history of one of the largest tells, a.k.a. ancient ruin mounds in Israel. The area in central Israel in the Tel Zayift uh, National Park and the Judean foothills has been inhabited almost continuously since the 5th millennium B.C. The researchers note in a press release, also recently discovered in Israel, was a mask unlike any other. It looked like Gilbert Godfrey. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's that's interesting. I mean, they found the gate to uh, to, to Gath there, yes. you know, and, and, you know, but they do, do, do you get the same kind of feeling as me that they kind of just skirted over the stargates? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I really feel like they... I think they, uh, it should be short and sweet. Well, yeah. The, well, well, they're not really short or sweet. They're kind of round. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, uh, I nearly got kicked out of a theater. I, went to, I can't remember what I saw about two weeks ago because I was booing and screaming. Hmm, maybe, maybe you were watching Stargate. <laughs> you know, maybe... Well, you know, the only reason I say that is because, you know, I've mentioned Stargate three times in the last 60 seconds. Yes. Right? <laughs> and then he comes out with that movie theater booing and screaming thing. I'm, I'm thinking there's probably a coalition there. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh, and on today, another terrible escalator accident in China. And, of course, you know, the people with the, the biggest population on the planet are really worried because two people died. <laughs> That's right. Another day, another devastating escalator accident in China. An employee at Longmont Shopping Mall in Shanghai's Changjing District has his foot and part of his leg amputated after becoming trapped on an escalator, according to the South China Morning Post. The worker, identified simply as Zhang. <laughs> yeah, like we'll, we'll never find Zhang in China. Yes. Right. <laughs> Well, Zhang was cleaning the escalator with a mop when he reportedly stepped on it, and the mall described a 35-year-old's action as improper. <laughs> Said that the mop's brush became trapped inside the gap in the stairs, which caused cracks in the comb plate. Video of the incident shows the escalator's floor plate breaking away and Zhang's left foot falling inside the moving staircase. A relative reportedly told local media the doctor said he had to amputate the foot to avoid injuries from deteriorating. The accident is the fourth escalator tragedy in China in six days. You know, the Americans are going to come out with a new horror flick, Escalator. <laughs> Well, as previously reported, Zhang Luian, yes, 30 years old, was killed last week when she similarly fell through an escalator floor plate at the Anlang department store in Hubei province. A graphic video shows Zhang pushing her son to safety before she is sucked to her death. Days after the incident, a one-year-old boy's arm was seriously injured after it became trapped in an escalator in Guangxi province, NBC News reports. And a six-year-old also was injured Saturday after his foot was caught in an escalator in Beijing. The incidents have led to escalator quality inspections in Shanghai and Hubei. Workers reportedly warned the mother just before she was swallowed by the evil escalator. <laughs> You know, and I'm thinking there's a new boom business here. Yes. You know, just in reading that story, I, I've pretty much uh, pretty much done the business plan and worked out the, the feasibility study. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm going to get some investors together. We're going to go over to China and open up a, a whole chain of escalator training outlets. <laughs> And and we will will bring that American know how that yes. that that American ingenuity that has saved so many lives. Yes. We're going to bring it over to China. We're going to teach them how to use the effing escalator. <laughs> and absolutely nothing, nothing, nothing but money to be made right there. I'll, I'll tell you. Yeah, I <laughs> I'm serious. Don't laugh. I'm going to be rich. You yes. dumbass. <laughs> 
Well, finally today, yes, our, our lovely final story, of course. And, uh, well, I think if you remember yesterday, I think our, our final story was, uh, I don't know, the, the, the University of Illinois being like the best party school. Yes. Right? <laughs> well, <clears throat> today we've got more uh, university news, but it's, uh, well, it's a little different today. It's about the Boston University students getting schooled on weed. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so you like roll it up and, and right, and then yes. You <laughs> okay, man. No, no, don't hog the huff. Don't hog the huff. No. <laughs> Come on, man. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, know. I don't know. How the hell do you be a druggie when you're not a druggie? I, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Wait a minute, I got lost. H T L A. You still there? H T L A. Is that? That, that is your phone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, anyway, the first day of class is usually filled with few awkward silences. The professor going over the sibilis and excruciating detail and maybe a cliche icebreaker or two. Dr. Seth Blumensall, a lecturer at Boston University's Arts and Sciences writing program, breaks the ice with one question for his students. What is your personal and generation stance on legalizing marijuana? Well, they analyze Gallup poll results and show that almost 70% of their generation supports the legalization of marijuana. And then I ask them why that is the case, Blumenthal says. The course is called Marijuana, an American History. <laughs> And it centers on the role of marijuana and what it should play in our society. I'm always looking for the most controversial topics, Blumenthal said. Hmm, well, how about gender fluidity, Deke? <laughs> <laughs> now, this was apparently a fascinating issue in that, uh, in a lot of ways, it gives us a window into society's larger anxieties. Blumenthal has taught the class for four straight semesters and will dive into it again in the spring of 2015. He says it's been a huge success with students and challenges them to, well, complicate the nature of their conversations about the contentious plant while smoking copious amounts of it. <laughs> well, they're not afraid to talk about marijuana at all, Blumenthal says. The issue becomes talking about it in a scholarly way to dig beneath the surface in an issue that is sort of giggle-worthy. <laughs> Yes, and think about where the deepest controversies might lie, whether it's analyzing the public service announcement of David Hasselhoff telling kids not to smoke weed, <laughs> and then watching the then-president Richard Nixon warn against the dangers of marijuana. Blumenthal wants his students to examine how America's perception of marijuana has developed over time through the academic lens. I give them the raw material, the actual evidence, bring in academic reading to contextualize and then issue and let them figure out what it all means, he says. Well, if that's what you're doing, how come they're going to be six figures in debt with student loans? <laughs> why, why, why just bring this stuff up and let them figure it out? Yes. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm paying you a hundred grand. You're going to teach me what it means. Yeah. Well, by examining modern youth issues, Blumenthal says that he's found students recognize the importance of history as a subject, a major that has taken serious dives in economic, or in not economic, academic enrollment. <laughs> yes, it's not your parents' history class, Blumenthal says. History as a subject really needs to rethink itself in the light of diminishing enrollments. And I think these are types of topics we can really sink our teeth into and reinvigorate debates about what role history plays in the larger conversation. One of the biggest revelations, he says, is his students find is that class is just not talking about weed and writing papers. But it's a demanding course that involves a lot of research and critical reflection and personal testing. <laughs> Blumenthal noted that the class, despite its success and popularity... Well, there he goes there. Yeah, all that boring news. What the hell? Well, hey, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, whatever it may be to you, gang. It's 5 o'clock in the big city, New York, right now. That's right. And you know what that means? Yes, coffee and cigarettes, your Wednesday grinder for this beautiful 5th of August 2015, 88 degrees Central Park right now, sunny skies... 
And we got Donald Trump. Nah, life couldn't be better. Life couldn't be better. I want to do some shout-outs and hey, how you doings to the folks in the live chat room, of course. Sharon Hunley Chesley, as always, the one, the only Stacey Watts, Phil DeYoung. And, and that's right, that lady from Tennessee, that's right, Leanne Thomas is in the house. Well, all kinds of others, too, but we won't go there because, well, to be honest, they're... They're dogs. Yeah. Well, hey, gang. Today on the big show, we've got police shooting. Yes, a gunman at a Tennessee movie theater. What is it with movie theaters these days? I don't know, but we'll get into that. And, of course, the wing flap found on that island was, of course, officially traced to that missing Malaysian jet today. Also, the FBI is probing the security of Clinton emails as GOP candidates dispute Obama on Iran. In other stories today, we'll tell you about China's craze for fancy chairs that is killing the entire planet's forests really quickly. And five great U.S. companies for working parents, and one of them's Google, so you know I've got more Google Wars coming up today. Yes, I do. That's right. All that and so much more. Wait till you hear what I did to Frankie McDonald today. It was epic, and it was recorded. I've got it. We're, we're, we're going with it right at the top of the show here. I'm not going to wait. So, hey, all that and so much more. Come on in and grab a cup. Have a seat, gang. Light one up. It is your coffee time. It is your coffee time today, 5.03 in the big city of Manhattan right now. And uh, pushing the buttons for us on the show today, as always, is the one, the only, Kissy Springer. Yes, and she's pushing the buttons on that pre 2442 digital broadcast mixer. And hey, if you're into audio, analog or digital, and you want anything that's the best... Get yourself on over to presonus.com because presonus has the best. There you go. Also, today's show is brought to you by the fine folks, Tim Hortons, New York City. Yes, now with those eight fine locations in the city to serve all of your coffee and baked goods needs, you'll never find a dirty video camera in their bathroom, but hey, they're still always fresh. Tim Hortons, check them out. Uh, Also, a reminder to head on over to NewYorksBestTalk.com. That is where we live. That's where the shows are, all the fancy shows, including the new ones this uh, season, which, well, the management here is already screwed up. So I'm looking forward to more screw-ups. How about you? (laughs) Well, also uh, joining us on the show, as always, is our our fine guest-slash-co-hosts. And, uh, well, these two men uh, bring it every day, in and out, never a problem or a worry. First of all, coming to us uh, live from the beautiful Mill Bay Film and Television Studios, uh, live in downtown Mill Bay, British Columbia, Canada, you will find the one, the only, Mr. Louis Lawless. Yes, uh, many, many times Academy Award nominated, never won one ever in his life, and he's not bitter. We, we're five steps away from winning the Academy Award, uh-huh. and we didn't. That's right, but it's okay. Uh, you're here now, and, 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 and just think. You know, if you'd won the Academy Award, we'd never be able to get you on this show, you know? I lived in I lived in Greenwich Village for a while when I first started out as an actor. Oh, did you? Okay, well, that's that's interesting and good to know. It's a, it's a hellhole now. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Oh, can we cuss? Can I cuss as I always do on... On the show? <laughs> uh, you, you know what? You go right ahead. Uh, we got you covered. I spent four and a half hours today with Kissy just teaching her exactly how to deal with you and your your endless cursing. It's about, about fucking time. Move on. Move on. <laughs> All right. See? see? See what a little bit of, of, of ingenuity does? A little bit of, of yes. you know... <laughs> Well, and also that little cackle that you hear, yes, of course, that's uh, coming to us from about eight blocks down the street here from Studio 2 in uh, Times Square. Is, of course, the one, the only 
Mr. Gilbert Gottfried. Uh, I don't even want to ask if you're ready. What uh, the fuck? Well, <laughs> you never are. I'm ready. Really? You are? Okay. All right, sir. Do your intro. And this is... I f that up. Right. Yeah. See? <laughs> that, that's why I never bother with that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, moving on today, before we get uh, rolling on the big show, we got a lot of stories to cover c- today, of course. Yes. And, uh, but before that, before that, there, there's some important things about Frankie McDonald that, uh, well, I feel uh, that we have to make public. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I do. And, uh, well, the, the first one actually yes. is, um, well, it's it's actually an interview. That apparently, uh, thanks to all the, the 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 joy he's getting from you know, being on the show here, he's uh, <laughs> he, he's 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 moving up in the world in the food chain. He's becoming more famous now with 11 million hits on YouTube. Uh, I don't know why, but <laughs> but uh, anyway, the the, the 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 mainstream media now yes. is. Uh, is is taking notice of him, and for some ungodly, unknown reason, they're 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 going with it. Yes. I, I don't know. You know. I'm I'm almost waiting for him now to announce his candidacy for 2016. Yeah. Well, so without further ado, I'm going to bring you the uh, the clip we have of his interview this morning on a national television show, and uh, well, then I'll throw in my two bits. Yeah. Uh, I've got a I've got a fun little clip this morning I thought I'd do. You know when you meet those people in life who you know are going to go far? Frankie McDonald is one of those people for me. He's from Cape Breton Island, Nova Scotia, and he's become a YouTube sensation. He has over 11 million hits on his videos. That's because he makes weather forecasts for cities around the globe. And for this... For three years ago. ...on TV and radio platforms across North America. And today, he's on RUTV News. We even have a special guest for him, one of his idols. Frankie, thank you so much for joining me on RUTV News. I appreciate it. Yes. (laughs) So you have over 11 million views on your YouTube page. Where did all this start? Yes. (laughs) I I started my YouTube channel, Dogs Wokes, on June 13, 2011. And... And I had my other YouTube channel, Flank99, starting on December 27, 2007. I just did a video to the scenery. I did the very first video of myself on December 16, 2009. And so how does it make you feel that all these people are viewing you from around the world? It makes me feel great. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah? What about weather do you enjoy the most? I enjoy spring and fall because in the winter you get too much storms. And I do YouTube videos to warn people to get them prepared. In the summertime it's a lot hot and humid. People have a hard time to breathe and sweat to death. And you think living in Cape Breton because of the crazy weather we get there uh, maybe you know influenced you and in how you got involved with these weather videos? Yes. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot of bad weather anywhere in the Canada, United States. I study the weather models, and I look up the AccuWeather.com and the Weather Channel. And when it's a bad storm headed for anywhere in Canada, the United States, I make a YouTube video, and I warn people to get them prepared. Now, you've appeared on uh, some radio and TV stations, like I said, across North America, both in Canada and the U.S., right? Yes, I like that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, so how many appearances have you made in the media? Do you know? I have made it to the Tosh.0 in June 2010. And so since then, you've made dozens of media appearances. What show do you still want to go on? Maybe like Ellen or something like that. What would be the show that you still want to go to? My videos will be going on Ellen show anytime soon. We'll, we'll, we'll try to get you there. I hope, I hope you, we get you there for sure. Uh, So, Frankie, here's the thing. Everybody knows you from your weather videos, but you're a very smart, talented guy. You have other talents as well. I know this because I've I've met you personally, and one of them, I know, is that you are a geographical whiz. You know how to get from point A to point B 
and every highway you need to take. So can you tell me how a person would drive, uh, very quickly, just tell me how I would drive from, say, Sydney, Nova Scotia to Toronto? And after Grand Lake Road, take the Highway 125, take the exit 105, head westbound on 105, transcan the highway, then you go over to Cancel Causeway, then you're on the 104, transcan the highway, once you get into the Brunswick border, then it's Route 2, once you get into the Quebec border, then it becomes 185, then you merge with Route 20, then once you get near Montreal, then it becomes 25, then you make it left into Route 40, then you make it on the left <laughs> 540, make it right into Route 20, then it's crossing the Ontario border, then it becomes 401, 401 goes all the way to Metro Pal to Toronto, you have to take an exit to Yon Street, head southbound to Yon Street to get to downtown Toronto. Wow. That's amazing. I think you're better than Google Maps. No. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned earlier that you have had two different YouTube accounts, right? You started with Flank99 back in uh, uh, the late 2000s, and you deleted that, you said, because of some bad comments that you had. And it's unfortunate that, obviously, this happens online. How do you deal with people like that? Because, obviously, you have many good fans as well, right? But how do you deal with the bad apples? I always ignore rude comments and negative comments and bad people all the time. That's why he doesn't talk to me. Yeah. <laughs> what would be your future dream job when you get older? I, I want to be famous. And, and what do you what do you want to do? You want to be a weatherman? My dream job is when I was a little boy, I want to grow up and I want to be a weatherman. That was when I was a little kid back then. Oh, yeah. How does your yes. family, I know your mom must be very proud. How do they take all this and all the weather videos you're doing? Uh, my family and my friends are very proud of me. A lot of people in Sydney, Nova Scotia, and the rest of Nova Scotia are very proud of me. I make Cape Breton Island and Nova Scotia and the rest of Canada proud, including Sydney, Nova Scotia. Oh, yeah. In terms of your idols, people that you yeah. uh, look up to, people who have inspired you over the years, who would you say your favorite weather anchor or weather personality is on TV? Chris St. Clair of the Weather Network. Okay, well, I've got a special message for you, okay, from a special someone. So let's just take a listen to this. I'm just going to play this for you. Hang on. Hey, Frankie. It's uh, it's Chris St. Clair, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of honored that you, you like the work that you do, and, and I really like the work that you do, too. I know a lot of people have been following you on YouTube and your weather forecasts, and I think you have a really unique style the way you do them. And, you know, I'm looking forward to the next time there's a big storm. In, uh, in Nova Scotia, because I'm from Nova Scotia, and, and and I'd like to get down there to meet you. I think that'd be kind of neat, and we could talk about the weather. I'll give you a copy of my book, and, and, and maybe someday when I retire, which maybe will be sooner rather than later, you can have my job. So there you go, Frankie. You heard from Chris St. Clair yourself. What do you think? I like uh, doing my YouTube videos and my weather reports, and... And I always do a great job all the time. If it's a bad storm, it hit it. Hit it <laughs> Well, Chris St. Clair is clearly a fan, as are millions around the world, and oh, yeah. making me proud. So I really appreciate your time today, Frankie. Thank you for joining me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, take care, and we'll talk soon. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> You know that Frankie, he's just so damned eloquent in interviews. <laughs> Isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, so that was him uh, with the, the big interview. Uh, huge worldwide media attention there. Uh, yes. <laughs> I don't know what the hell, what the hell that was. But, uh, yeah, so he, 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 he you heard it yourself. He, he gets to actually get a nice message from a person he apparently idolizes. Yes. And then, of course, when they ask him what he thought about that great special message his idol sent him, he's like, oh, I do the YouTube videos on the YouTube. And, uh, <laughs> mm. <sighs> kind of not working out too well, I think. He well, needs love, Chris. Come on. Well, I know. you gotta, you got to dispense more love from yourself. All these people are, are hurting here. Let them hurt. <laughs> Well, anyway, whatever. You know, the the long and the short was uh, it's great he's getting exposure, I guess. Yes. Uh, we'll just leave it at that. And, uh, th you know, that's not even the fun thing. The fun thing is what yes. what I did to him this morning when I came into work. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I, I got the, had the little recorder going with me there yes. this morning when I came in. And, uh, well, I'll just let you hear how uh, how it went down this morning. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, there you are. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Ah, good morning, Frankie. Okay, guys. I'm going to do a video about the guy eating 50 hot dogs at once. Really? You're going to do videos in HTLA here eating hot dog? Here, no. No, no, I got a much better idea for you. I got a hot dog right here. Hang on. <laughs> there we go. Here you go, Frankie. Eat this. Here you go. Here you go. Hold on. Clog. Clog. That's it, Frankie. See? See, you are talented. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I see. I see now why they're keeping you around. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. You like it. That's right. Who's your daddy? Yeah. <laughs> oh. oh, that was... That was good, Frankie. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> you, just, you just did. Yeah. Thank you. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's going to be a great day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can't get up anymore. That's okay. You don't need to. Just, just lay back. Thanks for watching. <laughs> That's how we deal with people we don't like at work. That's right. <laughs> well, you know, it just dawned on me the other yes. day. You know, it, it seems that no matter how hard I try, I can't get rid of him in his current job. Yes. You know. <laughs> so fine. You know, I, I figured, okay, well, you know, uh, let's 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 look at some of those motivational, positive people out there who, who are like, you know, when you have somebody at work that you just don't like, you can think of all sorts of positive, fun things to do with them. <laughs> and, and, and you know, lo and behold, they're right. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, as you just heard, uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was a great stress reliever for me today. <laughs> yeah. Ah, uh, but enough fun. <laughs> yeah, so uh, be sure to stick around for after the uh, first commercial break, and uh, if his throat's better, you'll hear Frankie do the weather. Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> Moving on today into the, some of the top stories, of course, our uh, Tennessee news. Yes, uh, police shoot gunman at a Tennessee movie theater in Nashville today. A gunman who attacked a movie theater in suburban Antioch is dead less than an hour after the incident was reported, authorities said today. The suspect, who opened fire, also had a hatchet and may have injured one person with it. Three people were injured with pepper spray, and one of the three had superficial wounds that may have come from a hatchet, says spokesman Brian Hass of the Metropolitan Nashville Fire Department. No other injuries were reported. The shooting was reported at 1.13 this afternoon Central Time, just as Mad Max Fury Road 2D was <laughs> scheduled. <laughs> Of course, to start at the uh, the Carmike Hickory 8 theaters at 901 Bell Road, according to dispatchers and other records. At about 1.50 this afternoon, police scanner traffic indicated the incident was still active, but a tweet from the Metropolitan Nashville Police Department announced the gunman's death at 2.07 p.m. <laughs> Now at about 2, uh, 2.20, officials say that they were examining two backpacks, one on the suspect and one left in the theater, to determine whether they were dangerous or not. Officers entered the theater uh, showing Mad Max through the projection room and engaged the suspect in gunfire, police spokeswoman Don Aaron said. The officers started at, uh, started at the projection room, started clearing down, uh, Aaron said. He encountered the gunman. The gunman opened fire on the South Precinct officer that returned fire and then backed away out of the theater. The SWAT team responded and confronted the suspect, Aaron said. There was gunfire and the gunman is deceased just inside the movie theater, he said. So we believe the imminent threat has been ended. Extra police patrols reportedly were assigned at the uh, Carmike Bellevue 8 theaters less than 20 miles away. The incident comes almost two weeks after a gunman opened fire inside a movie theater in Lafayette, Louisiana during the screening of the film Trainwreck. In the July 23 shooting, uh, J John Russell uh, Hauer 
59, killed two people and wounded nine others before fatally shooting himself. Eric Vale, 32, said he was an Uber driver dropping off passengers in the theater parking lot when shots rang out and described the scene as utter chaos. Shouldn't he have said Uber chaos? <laughs> Well, I just couldn't believe this was happening again, he said. Well, Jer Jeremy Cardoza, who works at the Ford Ice Center nearby, said his business was immediately put on the lockdown with no, being, no one being allowed to enter or leave. About 25 people, mostly children, were inside. Oh, right, because it's a skating rink. That's why there's all the kids there. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they 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 just went. Uh, that's that's all the uh, the details. Of course, we have at this particular hour. Yes. The, the the for some reason they've got like German shepherds all over parking lots sniffing cars. I, I don't. <laughs> maybe maybe it's a, a new hobby thing, or or maybe you know those drug sniffing dogs enjoy sniffing cars. <laughs> you never know, you know. That was a mistake on my part. Oh, did you sniff cars as a youth? <laughs> huh? Well, it's okay, Louie. I mean, it happens to the best of us. God, yes. <laughs> you know. I remember when I was 18, I was kind of a late bloomer, but I started sniffing cars. Yeah. Well, we're going to go for that first commercial break now, thanks to my, uh, well, morning blowjob. I, I uh, kind of ate up a little more time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> What we, what we do here is we just eat up time. Well, we're going to go for that first commercial break. When we come back, of course, we'll have Brock Favors, uh, Frankie McDonald, if he can still get talking, uh, all that good stuff. And then, of course, we'll tell you about that uh, wingtip found is indeed the one that was traced to the missing Malaysian jet, uh, which I confirmed last week. Yeah. <clears throat> but nobody listens to me, so screw you. <laughs> That's fine, that's fine, that's fine. You you know where your daddy is. Uh, we'll be back in two, gang. You've got it locked to HTLA Radio 1, New York. What if there was a coffee that was sourced from some of the world's most renowned growing regions? Abundant with rich, fertile soil. What if this coffee was picked at the perfect moment, then packed meticulously and shipped carefully to be roasted under the watchful eye of coffee masters? What if it was expertly blended, ground, and sealed, ensuring maximum flavor and freshness, then brewed in small batches and always served fresh within 20 minutes just the way you like it? Now, what if this coffee just happened to be the coffee you already know and love? Tim Hortons. Always fresh. Always great tasting coffee. Automatic freshness, softness, and static control has never been easier with the Bounce Dryer Bar. I just stick it to the inside of my dryer, and I never have to remember. Oh, Old Spice Body Spray makes you smell like power! It's so powerful it sells itself in other people's commercials. You smell like outdoor freshness. You smell like power. Yeah, I do. Power! When we arrived at our hotel in New York, the porter was so incredibly careful, careless with our bags. And the room they gave us... It was, it was beautiful. A broom closet. But the, but the best part worst part was, was the shower. shower. My, My wife drying herself with the Egyptian cotton towel shower curtain to find that whole vacation, whole vacation for, her. for her. Don't just visit New York. Visit TripAdvisor New York. With millions of reviews, a visit to TripAdvisor makes any destination better. White Rum has a new captain. Introducing the all-new Captain Morgan White Rum. Five times distilled for a smoother taste. 
Nazis on Hogan's Heroes were Jews. Oh, yeah? I, you know, I, I, I did not know that. Yeah. No? <laughs> no. Hey, you two Jews! Hey, you. There you go. <laughs> yes, yes, a little Cary Grant for your listening a pleasure. How about some uh, Jerry Lewis and Hervé Villachez? Huh? Here's Jerry Lewis yeah. acting Hervé <laughs> Villachez. Hervé! Hervé, can you ask? With the realistic person acting? Ah, yes, me that is. Ah, good friend. <laughs> we admire you. Oh, thank you, you short midget person. <laughs> ah, it's you do choice. Not like that, the uh, midget. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, little person with the thing with the thing. <laughs> yeah, the thing with the thing. Is only the tip of the iceberg. That's right, Louie, it is. That's right. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Stacy Stacks has been escorted out of the theater. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know what to do with the little girl's mouth, but when it starts getting that way, it's gone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, Frankie, I'm sure, will attest to that fact. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Uh, it's just life, and I love doing it. I love doing these kind of stories anyway. All right. Well, hey, you're in the right place then. That's right. HTLA Radio 1, New York's best talk, of course. And this is your Wednesday grinder for the beautiful 5 August 5. That's right. New York, 86 degrees right now. Central Park. Uh, it's gorgeous out there. Get the hell out there. Stop listening to me. <laughs> That's right, because it's only me. It's this guy. <laughs> That's right. We, we don't actually have a radio station. We don't actually, you know, Frankie doesn't work for us. Uh, there is no CEO because I'm not married. I live alone in a basement and I broadcast every week from Pacoima. <laughs> But no, if you are just joining us, you're joining us live from Studio 2, right down here in, uh, well, what the hell is it, Times Square 2, I think it is? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I just know there's a big number two on the, the, the side of the building outside, and I just come in, and Frankie's there, and, <laughs> you know, the the rest is really history, you know? They get f***ing crazy, because all of a sudden, nobody loves them. Well, I tell you, I loved Frankie this morning. <laughs> yes, I did. But that's okay. You know what? That's fine. We don't need uh, anybody messing with our stuff. Yes. So, yeah. Oh, right. So, yeah, now I guess without any further ado, of course, uh, and to fulfill our NAACP obligations with our token black man, (laughs) we must now go live, of course, to HTLA Chopper 1 and the one, the only, Brock Favors with your traffic. Hello, everybody out there. This is Brock Favors with Traffic on the Ones. Chad Armstrong is out sick today. So I am filling in for my usual land reports. And uh, I'm up here at the chopper. But I got to tell you guys, I am loving the view. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. Oh, oh, no, shit! Oh. Oh. oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> well, we are, um, uh. We are over the 10, and it's massively clogged down there like a pint of maple syrup on a cool November morning. And we do, oh, shit, we're gonna die in this motherfucker! <laughs> oh, shit, oh, my God! Oh, my God! Take a breath, Brock. Take a breath. Okay, <laughs> yeah. okay I am, uh, I am very sorry, folks. <laughs> There's a little bit of a bumpy ride up here. We are now approaching the 405, uh, where the left lane is blocked by a mattress. So somebody is uh, going to be doing a little return to Ikea later today. You know what I'm saying? Oh, no, please! Oh, goddamn! Oh, get me out this motherfucking dumb machine right now! Right now, I ain't no 
nobody going down this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry, folks. I'm very sorry about the but I'm losing my shit up here. Actually, you have every right to. We're about to crash. Oh, me. Oh, <laughs> <sighs> that hurts every time, you know? <laughs> well, once again, HTLA would like to offer its condolences, of course, to the Favors family. Yes. That was a mistake on my part. Oh, were you flying today? <laughs> huh? No. A- 88 thousand dollars a year they make yeah i know but usually news chopper pilots make a little more than that louis but uh, in this case you'd be right because we don't pay them very much at all yeah. <clears throat> well moving on today of course uh we we've got to do uh, i hate to do it of, yes. of course because it's you know frankie and the weather yes <laughs> but uh we do now have to go to uh, HTLA meteorologist Frankie McDonald with the weather, and uh, I do know that yes. uh, I do know that he his throat is actually up to it again. He uh, he took that uh, throating quite well this morning. <laughs> and, uh, no, no, he did, and, and the reason I, I'm saying that, yes. you know, I'm, I'm not just being a callous prick. I'm, yes. No, no, no. <laughs> No, I, I know that because uh, he he just, uh, before the show, he screamed down the hall to me. Uh, it, I was recording that, too, because I have to record everything because I'm looking for a wrongful dismissal suit. <laughs> so. <laughs> but he, he did yell down the hall to me about an hour ago uh, before the show. Yes. And, uh, of course, he said this. I, I want to be famous. <laughs> <laughs> So there you go. You heard it here first. Frankie McDonald wants to be famous. There you go. So without further ado, I guess we'll bring it to you. Uh, probably your weather report from three years ago. Uh, but here he is nonetheless, and I'm doing my job professionally. Suck it. Yes. Yeah. So now we go to uh, HTLA meteorologist, the one, the only Frankie McDonald with your coffee and cigarettes weather, Frankie. This is Frankie McDowell, my own TV station, live in Sydney, Nova Scotia. Major storm is heading for South Dakota on Friday, October the 4th, 2013. It's going to bring it up to 30 plus millimeters of rain. The rain will fall sideways. The winds are going to be very strong in South Dakota. It's going to be a high winds and heavy rain in South Dakota. It's going to bring colder temperatures as well. Because the low pressure is going to intensify, then it's going to turn into a major storm in South Dakota. It's going to bring a lot of rain, a lot of wind. Because of the warm and humid air, it's going to meet with the cold air coming from the north. That's going to cause a lot of rain. People in South Dakota, be prepared. Have your rubber boots ready, have your raincoats ready, have your rain suits ready, because... A lot of rain. A lot of winds heading for South Dakota. Order your pizzas and order your Chinese food. It's going to be a stormy conditions in South Dakota. It will affect parts of Nebraska. Nobody and lives Minnesota in Nebraska. As well. No. Don't open up your umbrella or your umbrella will get broken. It's going to be a heavy downpour, very strong winds. Frankie. Um, and winds will be howling in South Dakota on yeah. Friday, October the 4th, 2013. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be very stormy conditions in South Dakota. Okay, nobody cares about South Dakota. No. <laughs> They're saying in the chat you drive room. Your car, <laughs> avoid the puddles and don't drive your car to the puddles just in case the car can get stalled. Especially very deep puddles. When you go for a walk, wear your rain coats and wear your rain gear and rubber boots and put put up your hood up on your head to keep your head dry. Don't open up your umbrella. 
Rory and Browning can get broken because it will be way too windy in South Dakota on Friday, October 4, 2013. <laughs> winds will be very strong and howling winds in South Dakota. It will also affect parts of Nebraska and parts of Minnesota as well. I think there's Indians there. If it's cold there. enough, yeah. it may bring some <laughs> little bit of wet snow in South Dakota as well. Yeah. Snow. But the snow yeah. will melt yeah. on the ground. Best of luck to our people in South Dakota. Be prepared for a powerful storm. Have your iPads no. charged. Jesus. Have your iPods <laughs> charged. Have your iPhones charged. Have your cell phones and tablets charged. 3G. Yeah. <laughs> Buy bottle of water, buy cases of Pepsi and Coke. Mm. Are you done? <laughs> All right. Thank you, Frankie. Have we, your uh... crank up radio ready. <laughs> Have your 3G and 4G internet ready. Have your flashlights ready. Right. Have your extra batteries ready, just in case the power goes out during the storm in South Dakota on Friday. Best luck to you. People in South Dakota, be prepared yeah. for a powerful storm. Take care. All right. Stay safe. Don't get do, caught in a storm. Be safe. Do, 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 are you, you, okay, yeah, that's good. He he is officially done. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, I think what the magnetism is to this Frankie McDonald character. Yes. I think what it is is that every report he does, it always sounds like end of days. <laughs> You know that, and 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 here's the other thing, and and even Phil DeYoung pointed it out in the, in the chat room there. Yes. Uh, never mind it being two years old weather news. We we can deal with that. Yes. You know, <laughs> we 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 can deal with that because you know, really, pretty much, um, it's probably the same as it is today. So you know, whatever. But but I mean, South Dakota, like nobody's there except Indians and casinos. You know. They get f***ing crazy because all of a sudden nobody loves them. What, the Indians? <laughs> yeah. Okay, well. He well, needs love, Chris. Come on. Yeah, well, you know what? I gave him love this morning, buddy. Listen, check it out. Did he? Yeah. <laughs> oh, there you are. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Ah, good morning, Frankie. Okay, guys, I'm going to do a video about the guy eating 50 hot dogs at once. <laughs> really? You're going to do videos in HTLA here eating hot dog Here, no. No, no, I got a much better idea for you. I got a hot dog right here. Here you go, Frank, eat this. Here you go. Here you go. Here. 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 That's it, Frankie. See? See, you are talented. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I see. I see now why they're keeping you around. Oh, yeah. That's right. You like it. That's right. Who's your daddy? Uh, you know, and 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 nobody, nobody. I'm yes. telling you out there right now, nobody uh, can be offended at this because, of course, as we're clearly displaying, we're not only just employing token black people, <laughs> but we are also doing our bit to support gay rights. There you go. Is only the tip of the iceberg. Well, it used to be, Louis, but now it's a goddamn political statement. So, <laughs> you know, there, there's there's not a whole lot I can do about that. Yes. You know, it's, it's it's not my fault. I didn't bring this, but hey, you know, that's the way the world is now, so you can all suck it. Yeah. There you go. Well, moving on today, we can actually get to that uh, wingtip story. <laughs> That's right. A uh, wing flip that was found on an island, of course, was traced to a Malaysian jet, which I, I I personally confirmed on the show last week, but nobody listens to me. So, And that's enough talk about my cocktail weenie, Sharon. <clears throat> 
Well, experts confirmed that the wing flap found on an island in the Indian Ocean brings uh, belongs to the missing Malaysia Airlines Flight 370. Malaysian Prime Minister Najib Razak said today... Today, 515 days since the plane disappeared, it is with a heavy heart that I must tell you an international team of experts have conclusively confirmed that the debris found on Reunion Island is indeed from Flight 370, Razak said at a news conference. Now we have physical evidence that Flight 370 tragically ended in the southern uh, Indian Ocean. Uh, and he pledged to cut up the 273 pieces equally of the uh, wreckage found to send to the families of the deceased. <laughs> no, Paris Deputy Prosecutor Serge Makasawak expressed slightly less certainty, citing a strong supposition that the flapperon confirmed earlier this week to be from a Boeing 777 was part of the missing jetliner. Analysis aimed at confirming the information would begin Thursday, he said at a news conference. Yeah, I always like to to go and have the news conference on the Wednesday and then go confirm the findings scientifically on the Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> Malaysia Airlines released a statement calling the information a major breakthrough into why the plane disappeared. Family members, really? How? What the hell? <laughs> what, because it lost its wingtip? <laughs> Really? <laughs> well, family members of passengers and crew have already been informed, and we extend our deepest sympathies to those affected, the statement said. Well, come on. It was almost 600 days ago. They're not still crying, are they? <laughs> <laughs> well, Flight 370 vanished March 8, 2014, after taking off from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, bound for Beijing with 239 people on board. Most of the victims were Chinese. Well, that's that's pretty bad. Yes. But, I mean, if you add up the escalator deaths since then, that's like 10%. <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, earlier today, investigators in France began examining the flapperon, which was found on the beach in the town of St. Andre a week ago. Uh, the part was taken to the DGATA aeronautical testing site near Toulouse, in southern France. In addition to determining that, that the flapperon came from MH370, investigators from Malaysia, France, and the U.S. will examine the metal on the wing piece with microscopes and try to find out what caused the plane to go down. However, if the plane was hit by a missile or a UFO or alien starship, anywhere else on the plane, they wouldn't know. <laughs> Now, the French island of Reunion is about 3,500 miles southwest of Malaysia and more than 2,000 miles from the area of the Indian Ocean where Flight 370 is suspected to have crashed. Well, that's a small discrepancy. It was only 2,000 miles from where it should have been. That's fine. <laughs> you know, just, just almost the entire span of the United States. And, well, it's no wonder it took them 500 days to find it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Ranzak thanked the dozens of nations that have aided in the search for the plane and expressed sympathy for the families. Moments before he spoke, a text message alert was sent out to family members of the victims explaining the findings. The burden and uncertainty faced by the families during this time has been unspeakable, he said. It is my hope that the confirmation, however tragic and painful, will at least bring certainty to the families and loved ones of the 290, uh, 239 people on board the MH370, and they have our sympathy and prayers. Confirmation the plane crashed in the ocean could help many family members with the grieving process, says Nancy Smith, the dean of university at Buffalo School of Social Work who studies psychological traumas. Well, that's got to be a fun profession. <laughs> uh. Well, this does provide those families with the needed closure, Smith said. Knowing the plane did indeed crash, most families... Uh, that will help them come to terms with the loved ones and, and that they're really gone and that they'll know that they weren't sucked up by aliens to be deposited on another planet 200 years from now. <laughs> Still, many Chinese relatives have clung to hope that the jet, jet liner would be found with all aboard safe and have protested that they see a lack of information from authorities investigating a plane's disappearance. What's wrong with these Chinese people? Didn't they see 4200? <laughs> Well, there are still some still wondering if their loved ones are still sitting on the island, Smith said. Well, if they're still sitting on the island, it's about 12 feet down from the velocity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Well, there are still tons of questions which also also affect the grieving process, such as why the plane crashed. It's a big piece for them. Uh, why can't they just accept the conspiracy theorists' uh, thing that it was sucked into a vortex by aliens? I don't, you know, you know that that's the thing. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting yes. here, you know, if 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 you know uh, any of my family were on board the thing, you know, I'd be like, oh, geez. Oh, my God, I'll, I'll never know what happened to him. Some whack job conspiracy theorist comes along. Yes. <laughs> He's like, oh, Crash, your, your wife and children have been sucked up by aliens and they're on the planet Astronar. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know what? I, I'd feel better knowing they're alive somewhere on Astronar. Yes. <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, uh, thinking that they're pounded 12 feet into the sand on some island in Borneo, you know. <laughs> That's uh, that, that's not very cool to me, of course. But uh, you know, having that vision in my mind that they're living out their lives happily on on Astronar, yes. you know, <laughs> that 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 would make me feel comforted. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what, don't 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 screw my fantasy. Like, you know. <laughs> well, moving on today, of course, we've got FBI probes. Yes, no, not those kind of probes. Yes. <laughs> No, the FBI probes, of course, of the Clinton emails. The FBI has begun a review into the security of uh, Hillary Clinton's private email system that she used during her time as Secretary of State. Uh, what, what is this now, six years later? Yeah. <laughs> That's good. The FBI is, you know, right in there, right when you need them. Yes. Right? Just... Okay, six years later, the equipment was sold off long ago. All our servers and hard drives, they're, they're, they've all been liquidated, you know, because they do that every four years. <laughs> you know. Uh, so, yeah, now five, six years later, yeah, fill your boots, FBI. Come and investigate. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's what this is. That's what this is right here. <clears throat> yes, the FBI has begun, finally, a review into the security of Hillary Clinton's private email system that she used during her time as Secretary of State, a, a federal official confirmed today. The official, who was not authorized to comment to us publicly, said the review follows a referral last month to the Justice Department from the Inspector General overseeing the government's intelligence community, expressing concern about potential compromise of proprietary information. Now that the government lot sales have uh, finalized, they, they've they okayed the FBI to come in and look at the brand new servers. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> well, the Washington Post also reported that the FBI also contacted Clinton's lawyer, David Kendall, last week with questions about a security of a thumb drive that he has with copies of emails from Clinton's tenure as Secretary of State. The governor, or the government, sorry, is seeking assurance about the storage of those materials Kendall told the Post we're actively cooperating. Four emails containing classified information were identified among 30,000 emails that Clinton handed over to the State Department for review. The Inspectors General for the State Department and the Office of Director of National Intelligence said a joint in a joint statement last month. The Washington Post said a lawyer for a Plate Pallet River Networks, the Denver tech company that helped manage Clinton's server and that was contacted by the FBI, declined comment as they had uh, gotten rid of the equipment two years ago. <laughs> there you go. And that, that just, uh, you know, that's, that. why why spend the money and, and bother even talking about this? Yes. You know, it's, it's like Benghazi. It's already been covered up, done, uh, washed hands, moving on, you know. <laughs> And there's there's no threat for Scooby Doo in the White House anyway, so it, it it really it really doesn't matter. But we do have some news about some of those GOP candidates, of course, uh, disputing Obama on Iran. We're going to have that when we come back from our second commercial break. Back into. We're New York's best talk radio, HTLA Radio One. Good morning. Welcome to Tim Horton's Cafe and Bake Shop, where fresh always tastes better. What can I make you this morning? How about our new flatbread breakfast paninis? Made fresh, just for you, with your favorite breakfast ingredients on maple or multigrain flatbread, then grilled to hot, melted perfection. Just $2.99. Who couldn't warm up to that? 
Tim Horton's Cafe and Bake Shop, where quality really does meet value. When we arrived at a hotel in New York, the porter was so incredibly careful, careless with our bags. And the room they gave us, it was beautiful. A broom closet. But the best part, part was the shower. My, My wife drying herself with the Egyptian cotton towels. Shower curtain to find that whole vacation, whole vacation for, her. for her. Don't just visit New York. Visit TripAdvisor New York. With millions of reviews, a visit to TripAdvisor makes any destination better. Let's do a brand new day. Let's step away from the bland and let the color fly. Let's get to the one store with more number one choices and match this or this without using too much of this. Then let's crack open a can and get to it. Paint? No. Let's do POW. Let's do this. More saving, more doing. That's the power of the Home Depot. Glidden Duo starts at a new lower price of $25.46 a gallon. White Rum has a new captain. Introducing the all-new Captain Morgan White Rum. Five times distilled for a smoother taste. You've got it locked to HTLA Radio 1, New York. Don't forget to follow us on our Facebook page. Yeah. On Twitter and on Instagram. That's right, and if you if you need any help with that, it's pretty simple. You just go to Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or any of those places and just type in in a search, HTLA Radio 1, you'll find it. <laughs> That's the famous story about Jerry Lee Lewis. You heard that story, haven't you? Uh, I... Sitting behind his desk at Paramount, uh, talking with big executives and, and TV people, and all of a sudden the chick pops up underneath, wipes off her mouth, and walks out the and Jerry doesn't have an eye. <laughs> Some guys get all the luck. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But that's okay, you know, now I've got my little uh, mouse whenever I need it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not so bad, actually, having Frankie McDonald around anymore. Uh, and in case you missed it, well, too bad. Uh, rewind. The yeah. music. It's fantastic. Oh, yeah. Oh, you got to hear it. I don't have to hear it, Louie. It's playing right now. and. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you give me any help for $25,000? Uh, not even if you blew me. No. <laughs> if I go a half an hour, do I get 50000 No. You know, what, what the hell do you need all that money for? Yes. You know? <laughs> I tried. To, I need to try and raise twenty-five thousand dollars to enter the Academy Awards, and I think it's a fantastic risk because we have a tremendous chance. Two hundred. No. Uh, there's about two hundred members that vote on it, and they all get. You have to give them a DVD now. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you think it's a terrific risk. Uh, until you can convince others it's a terrific risk, you're pretty much boned. <laughs> yeah. Ah, well, welcome back to the big show today. Your coffee and cigarettes, Wednesday Grinder on HTLA Radio 1, New York's Best Talk. That's right, New York's Best Talk.com. Get there, eat it up, lick it, lick it. <laughs> <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, so moving on today, we got uh, still a lot to, to cover in the stories, don't you worry. And, you know, if I quit screwing around with sound bites, we can actually get to them. So. <laughs> You know. <clears throat> of course, the next one up for bids here is the GOP candidates disputing Obama on Iran. Like, ooh, geez, there's a shocker. I never saw that coming. <laughs> and yes, that was John Kerry. That was... <laughs> <laughs> well, President Obama today attacked the Republicans over the Iran nuclear agreement. Yes, and of course, vice versa. Obama used a high-profile speech to argue, in part, that Republican opposition risks a nuclear-armed Iraq and a new military action in the Middle East. GOP presidential candidates said the agreement itself will strengthen Iran, paving its way to nuclear weapons. President Obama could give 100 speeches attempting to justify his appeasement of the rogue Iranian regime, 
and it wouldn't change a thing, says Wisconsin Governor uh, Luke Scott Walker. <laughs> Walker said the deal jeopardizes American safety and that and that of our allies, especially Israel, and that as president he would terminate this dis disastrous agreement on day one. The former Florida governor Jeb Bush weighed in on Twitter. Well, no, we all know Jeb takes nine years to make an informed decision. <laughs> so, so whatever I'm about to tell you that he said today, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just ignore it. He weighed in on Twitter saying, quote, the Iran deal paves the way to Iran getting the bomb and gives $150 billion to the mullahs. That's not leadership. And to which I responded on Twitter, actually. Yes. Uh, I said, what the hell's a mullah? <laughs> Well, in his speech at American University today, Obama likened opponents of the Iran agreement to those who favored the problematic war in Iraq in the first place. They, too, denounced their opponents as appeasers, Obama said. Well, no, Mr. Obama, if you look back in history, the guys who favored the uh, war in Iraq, those are the guys that own the companies like General Dynamics and Halliburton. <laughs> the Monsanto Cheney. <laughs> Well, now more than we ever need clear thinking in our foreign policy, Obama said. Yes, we do. So when are you bringing it? <laughs> well, the speech promoting the Iran agreement came a day before the Republicans gathered for the first presidential debate of the year. Obama and allies say the agreement shuts down in the technical pathway that Iran could take towards developing a nuclear weapon. The only alternative, they say, is military action against Iran. And nobody wants that, do they? <laughs> Yes, well, Republicans say that the deal leaves a wiggle room for Iran to cheat and cheat often. They also protest the reduction of sanctions, saying that it will allow the Iranian government to provide financing now for terrorist activities across the region and don't think they won't do it. Anybody remember Ayatollah Khomeini? <laughs> well, POTUS? Yes, this is this is the tweet from Lindsey Graham. Yes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yes, POTUS, hashtag Iran deal, empowers Iran with pathway to bomb, missiles to deliver it, money to pay for it, and means to a military, military arsenal, says Lindsey Graham. That's all she said. Yeah. <laughs> Just uh, that's cool. I, I love those those candidates that go out on the the limb and and don't say the same thing everybody else is saying. <laughs> you know, those 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 risk takers. Yes. Those those. Oh wait, there's none except for Trump. Yes. <laughs> and of course, uh, no comment from him on this because he's not that dumb. <laughs> Well, moving on today, let's talk about some, uh, well, uh, let's talk about the country with the highest population of idiots in the world. <laughs> and and no, I'm not talking about the United States. <laughs> no, 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 not by a long shot. Chengdu, China. Well, China clamps down on logging within its borders. Illegal Chinese loggers are now following the world, or falling, I should say, the world's forests with absolute abandon for the sake of teak floors and fancy chairs. In late July, 153 Chinese nationals were sentenced to life in prison for illegal logging of Myanmar's northmost Kashin state, a region rife with coveted teak, paddock, beechwood, ebony, and rosewood species. Last week, the Burmese authorities granted their release in a gesture of goodwill towards China, which is Myanmar's largest trading partner. But the gesture, while benevolent towards the loggers, will do nothing to stop the ongoing ravishment of the region by Chinese companies who have been plundering Myanmar for over a decade, mostly illegally. Thousands of precious teak trees protected by Myanmar's forest laws, as well as other species protected by timber export bans passed in 2014, are shipped every year to eastern China to be transformed into teak floors and luxury buildings or hongmu, redwood chairs, tables, and chests, once limited to Chinese elites. Hongmu is now lusted after by Chinese Novu Rish, 
Yes, the individual piece, piece, pieces fetching $1 million or more. Gilbert, get your coat. We're going into the furniture business. <laughs> Well, Myanmar isn't China's only victim either. Indonesia, which also has the world's highest carbon emissions rate owing to deforestation, placed a moratorium on logging four years ago. Since then, forests have continued to be chopped, and in 2013, half of the world's illegal timber came from Indonesia and ended up in China. Meanwhile, Cambodia suffers the world's third highest deforestation rate at 85% of its timber exports go to, you guessed it, China. The Democratic Republic of Congo, the world's sixth most forested country by area, created a logging permit system to combat deforestation, but industrial-scale logging continues. 90% of its logging is illegal, and last year, 65% of its entire timber exports went to, again, yes, China. China also became Brazil's leading market for wood in 2012. It consumes 80 to 90% of Papua New Guinea's timber, over 90% of Mozambique's, and in Equatorial Guinea, its log purchases have consistently exceeded the legal limit. What's fueling this ravenous appetite for timber? Well, it's simply the Chinese demand for wood. It's increased 300% from 2000 to 2011, in part due to the growth in China's construction industry, and a 474% increase per capita GDP, allowing more Chinese hotels, deluxe apartments, and upper-class consumers to quench their thirst for rare furniture products. Moreover, while late nations like the United States and Australia have passed laws banning the import of illegal wood, China refuses to do so, believing the cost would be too high. At the same time, China has passed bans on commercial logging within its borders. Heilangjiang Province in 2014 and Inner Mongolia and Jin or Jilin, last April, in fact, Beijing wants to cut commercial logging of state forests by 20% before 2020. The dis this discrepancy has brought charges of hypocrisy from observers. Faith Doherty, a team leader with the British NGO Environmental Investigation Agency, has described China's behavior as effectively exporting defore deforestation around the world. What, if anything, is the answer to this problem? Well, Alliston, Alliston wow, her last name is Hoare. <laughs> Yeah. And it is Alison Hoare, a senior environmental researcher at the British think tank Chatham House, wrote last month that Beijing should take a leadership role by raising the issue at ASEAN and the G20 summits. But China isn't likely to begin awareness-raising campaigns. As Bob Flynn says from the International Forest Director, of course, of the timber consultancy RISI, he says in a recent book about China's environmental impact, Chinese really don't care where their wood comes from as long as it's cheap. If you're talking about illegal logs from Indonesia cutting down the last tree in the Solomon Islands, they have no issues with that whatsoever. <laughs> or as one a Shanghai flooring company representative said, quote, we don't log or smuggle any teak out of Burma as for how the suppliers get teak. I don't really care. <laughs> So what will it take for Chinese, the Chinese to care about forests of Mozambique? A whore of Chatham House believes that the economic preservation or self-preservation may be the answer. I don't think that the approach taken by China is a question of protecting its backyard, not at least because the approach is failing to protect its domestic processing industry. She told Global Post to keep its huge timber processing industry alive, she said, and to, to develop its exports to prosperous nations and ban illegal imports. China needs to be able to ensure that materials which are being imported to supply the industry are legal. China has been exploring ways to tackle the trade in illegal timber, she added, citing work to create a verification system for legal wood. However, it's only just the beginning to be implemented by industry, and it remains a voluntary measure. So no changes uh, anytime soon for the China wood crisis. And, uh, well, you know what that means for us uh, back home here, of course. Uh, yes. They keep doing that. We're going to have no wood. Because, <laughs> of course, you know, um, they'll, they'll, they'll take it all. Yes. <laughs> right. <clears throat> well, moving on today, uh, now we're getting to, uh, well, to me, this next story is, is nothing but corporate propaganda fluff. <laughs> 
That's because uh, Google plays a huge part in it. (laughs) And uh, many of you, most of the listeners of this show, of course, they they know about my uh, war with Google last week. Yes. And, uh, of course, the the end of that, uh, what what did I say? In Um, addition to that... Yeah. You keep that ten bucks or whatever it is for these two email accounts for this month. Yeah. You go ahead and keep that. Don't think you're ever fucking charging us a penny more ever again, and we'll get our business for emails elsewhere. Uh-huh. Thank you yeah. very, very fucking much for absolutely nothing. Yeah. So, so we all remember the, remember that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well. Do, do you know? Do you know that yes. they had the balls? And I'm not even kidding. Uh, yesterday, they they actually charged us again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So so now they, they, they charge us for another month of suspension. Yes. <laughs> Isn't that nice? They charged us again. So uh, I, I just had enough. I'm not going to deal with it anymore. I I just called the lawyer. F him. <laughs> yeah. Just again, I can't believe it. That was a mistake on my part. Yeah, I can actually see you phoning them up and saying, "Yeah, yeah, charge him again. He's okay with it." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yes, the five great U.S. companies for working parents. Ah, yes. <laughs> yes. Well, Netflix unveiled its latest perk for employees this week with an update to its parental leave policy. The streaming giant now offers unlimited time off to new parents for up to a year after the birth or adoption of a child. However, Netflix is not the first major company to offer these progressive packages for parental leave. That's right. With firms seeking ways to retain talent and balance employee needs with corporate ones, better parental leave policies have become a way to incentivize workers to stay put, says Shinaz Firfere, uh, the assistant professor at the Warwick Business School. Companies have to develop com- policies, of course, that focus on evolving needs of their workforce, she added. That's why we've uh, put Frankie in a padded room. <laughs> Now he'll just come out for the weather reports and blowjobs. Our research suggests that individuals experience strain as a consequence of juggling several roles, demands at the time, and consequently one or more of these spheres, for example, work or family, will suffer, Furfrey said. Here's a list of five U.S. companies offering great parental leave benefits to its employees. Number one is uh, right down here in Times Square, of course, the the one, the only Ernst & Young. Yeah. Company offers up to 14 weeks of paid maternity leave and six weeks of paid maternity leave. Uh, Birth mothers can choose to take up to eight of their 14 weeks of paid leave prior to the birth of their child if they so desire. Microsoft is another company that's always leading the way in just about everything they do. The software corporation recently updated its parental care policies. The firm behind Windows and the Xbox now offers up to 12 weeks of paid maternity and paternity leave. Microsoft also allows birth mothers to use short-term disability leave up to two weeks prior to their scheduled due date. Google. (laughs) Yes, the tech giant offers up to 18 weeks of paid maternity leave and offers 12 weeks of paid baby bonding time to all primary Mexican caregivers. (laughs) Regardless, of course, of gender yes. or citizenship. Yes. <laughs> yes. The company also offers up to seven weeks of paid leave to caregivers, other than parents who play key roles in raising a baby. And I don't know why Google's getting the big hats off here. I mean, surely I'm not the only suspended one they're charging. If they keep charging customers who they suspend, well, they're going to have all kinds of money to do this shit. <laughs> Uh, number four is the Bank of America. Yes, the, the once broke Bank of America. <laughs> well, the popular banking firm provides up to 12 weeks of paid maternity, per paternity, and adoptive parent leave. Bank of America also provides up to 14 weeks additional unpaid leave. Our policy has always been one that is focused on both men and women, says Ferris Morrison, a spokesperson for Bank of America. We love homosexuals. <laughs> We also provide adoption support for homosexuals. <laughs> Further citing that we always try to meet the diverse needs of our sick fuck employees. 
And number five today is State Street. The professional assistance firm offers up to 12 weeks paid leave to mothers and up to four weeks paid leave for fathers. Additionally, the company offers eight weeks of paid leave for adoptive parents and grants up to $5,000 per homosexual <laughs> to, <laughs> to help offset adoption costs. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Quote, we're competitive in this space in order to engage employees and retain them, says Mike Skinnell, Senior Vice President of Global Human Resources for State Street. We have a pretty strong, flexible work program for gays. <laughs> there we go. <sighs> Fucking gays. <laughs> My film, Unrepented, did very well in Europe. Yes, yes. We, we know. <laughs> We, we know. You, you've told us a number of times. You know how to spell my last name on the check, right? It's Louis Lawler. Yes, you'll get your money. <laughs> yes. Well, moving along today, we got some uh, more little bits and pieces about the uh, Cecil the Lion case, of course. And no, not bits and pieces of Cecil. <laughs> no, no. Uh, yes, yeah, Cecil case, frivolous and wrong. A professional hunter accused of failing to stop a Minnesota dentist from killing Cecil the lion branded the case against him frivolous and wrong today. Arriving at a court in Hwangi, Zimbabwe, Theo Bronkhorst told reporters he believed he had the right permits and did not break the law. Bronkhorst faced his charges of failing to prevent an unlawful or failing to prevent an unlawful hunt. He face up to, faces up to 15 years in jail if convicted. Hunting is an integral part of our country and it's got to continue, he says. And we do not use wildlife sustainability. There will be no wildlife. He's good. <laughs> Well, his trial was per postponed, of course, to September 28th. Another guide was released without charges last week, but Bronkhurst acted as a guide for, of course, dentist Walter Palmer in the July 1st killing of Cecil, a much-loved lion in the Hoangi National Park. Palmer said that he believed the hunt was legal. Leaving the cor courthouse today, Bronkhurst said, I feel sorry for my client. He's a good man. He did nothing wrong, according to the agent's French press. <laughs> yes. Outside the courthouse, Givmore Meringi, Brokehurst's lawyer, said, My client is not guilty. The hunt was legal, and this is the petition we are going to defend when the trial opens, the Associated Press reported today. Cecil's death caused international outcry after Palmer, 55, who paid about $50,000 to track and kill the 13-year-old big cat, Cecil, who was part of an Oxford University study, was allegedly lured out of the national park with bait before being shot with a crossbow, subsequently tracked for 40 hours and then shot dead. Zimbabwe's environment minister has called for Palmer to be extradited. Also today, police in southwest Florida said vandals spray-painted the words, quote, lion killer on the garage door of Palmer's $1.1 million vacation home. <laughs> apparently left at least seven pickled pig's feet on the driveway. <laughs> well, the Florida police have opened an investigation and a security company has been hired to protect the property, the news agency said. American Delta and United Airlines have announced they are refusing to transport certain animal trophies. Zimbabwe officials on Saturday announced a ban on the hunting of lions, leopards and elephant in areas of Hwangi. So there you go. That's the latest on the uh, Cecil Saga. <laughs> yeah, the Cecil Saga. The Saga of Cecil. <laughs> it's a good... No. No, you, you know this is going to be a kid's book. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you got to love the kids. Yeah. How many different families do you have? Uh, so many, I don't even know how many kids I have. <laughs> I don't know. Which which uh, woman are you married to or living with now? Well, it, it was going to be Stacy Stacks, but now I've uh, understood that she's been kicked and banned. So <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm currently I'm currently shopping. Yes. Um, <laughs> shopping for a new one, but uh, Frankie will certainly do until. Uh, <laughs> Well, moving on today, uh, we got kind of a follow-up story to the, uh, well, the New York killers. Yes, those escapees that had New York State on the edge of its seat for like over a month and a half when I said they were in Texas. <laughs> um, 
And, of course, uh, New York prison escapee Richard Matt, who was, of course, the last one that they, uh, well, kill captured. Yes. Yeah. Well, the big news out today, apparently, is that uh, they've discovered that he was drunk when he was killed. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not even kidding. I don't even know how this qualifies as news, yes. but you know, if you if you're in prison for God, 5 months even, you know, you, when when you get out, the first thing you're doing is going to find some booze. So what's the big shocker? I, I don't I don't get it, but the prison escapee Richard Matt's blood alcohol level was more than twice the legal limit to drive a vehicle when he was shot and killed by police, New York State Police said today. Toxicology results showed that Matt had a blood alcohol content of 0.18 at the time of his death, June 26, police said. Well, that's nice. At least he slipped away feeling nothing. <laughs> That's right. His fellow escapee, of course, David Sweat, was captured two days later and is being housed in a maximum security facility at the Finger Lakes. They don't use fingers in prison. Come on. (laughs) Police said that Matt was carrying a shotgun and failed to comply with police orders to drop his weapon when he was discovered in the Adirondacks after the pair escaped from the Clinton Correctional Facility in Denmora back on June 6th. They are believed to have gotten the alcohol after breaking into hunting cabins in the mountains. Police says a U.S. Customs Border Protection Tactical tactical Unit member discharged several rounds from a semi-automatic weapon, striking Matt in the head three times, the police said. Yeah, he didn't feel nothing. (laughs) Well, the cause of death was severe skull fractures and brain injuries due to gunshot wounds to the head. Damn, they're good. (laughs) Well, Matt, who also had bug bites on his lower extremities, blisters, and minor abrasions consistent with living in the woods for three weeks. Uh, yes. Okay. Wow, Kissy, we got to start start talking about the news stories here. That's it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, fine. She says that's it. Yes. All right. All right. I claim no responsibility for the stories here. Everything I, that could go wrong goes wrong. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it does, and and you know, again, it's 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 not. You know, my job is to deliver it, not to make it. Same so, thing. You no, know, making news and delivering news is is quite different. You retard. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but I digress. Let's talk about Seinfeld. Hey, can I see a dick? There you go. <laughs> Actually, I don't think you want to see it. It's got Frankie teeth marks all over it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love doing this. Uh, uh, it's just life, and I love doing it. I love doing these kind of stories anyway. Well, I bet, yeah, you probably had a Frankie in your younger days. <laughs> yeah. Well, in our final story today on the old uh, Wednesday grinder here, and uh, <clears throat> I guess before I get into this, I should really uh, kind of say, you know, I've, I've hoped we've entertained you all today yes. and, and helped you get through your uh, Wednesday a little easier uh, than you normally would have without hearing Frankie blow me. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> there we go. Now that I've uh, stated that, I can move on with the final story of the day. Yes, yes I can. <laughs> there we go. Well, NASA is apparently to keep paying Russia to send astronauts to the space station. I didn't know NASA was paying the Russians to send anybody into space. <laughs> why, you know, why Why are we going to pay them? We, we, we had our own shuttles and stuff. Yes. We, we, no, we, we did, and we, we, we had a, a, a space program to be very proud of, yes. we, you know, and then we shut it down with all these budget cuts. Now we're paying Putin's cronies? What? <laughs> well, apparently so. In Washington today, NASA is extending its contract with Russia's space agency to transport U.S. astronauts to the International Space Station for the foreseeable future. Now that it appears very unlikely, Congress will provide the funding it's requesting to develop a domestic replacement for the mothballed space shuttle uh, system, NASA's Administrator Charles F. Bolden said today. 
In a letter to members of Congress who oversee NASA funding, Bolden said that the $490 million contract, quote, modification is due mainly to Congress not providing the agency adequate resources for its commercial crew programs. It costs taxpayers about $75 million for every ride on a Soyuz rocket uh, to the space station. Under the new contract, that will rise to nearly $82 million in 2018, according to NASA. Over the past five years, Congress had cut approximately uh, $1 billion from President Barack Obama's request for a commercial crew. Over that time, NASA's target for an initial launch has moved from 2015 now to 2017. Congress, while incrementally increasing annual funding, has not adequately funded the commercial crew program to return human space flight launches to American soil this year as planned. Another failed campaign lie. <laughs> Well, Bolden wrote in a letter to lawmakers, this has resulted in continued uh, sole reliance on the Russian Soyuz spacecraft as our crew transport vehicle for American and international partner crews to the International Space Station. Um, yeah, and, and why are we paying $82 million now yes. for Soyuz technology? That was from 1960. <laughs> really? Well, the Soyuz was 1960 when it when it actually went into active uh, duty as as an actual you know spacefaring vehicle for the Russians. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's a true story. 1960. That's when they 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 really they kicked off that Soyuz and went nunvigetsa. <laughs> so so let me get this straight. We're paying 82 million dollars a head now. Yes. To send up American astronauts when we were paying seventy million dollars a head. Yes. Uh, up until now, uh, why is the price going up on shit that's fifty-five, sixty years old? Why? What? <laughs> <laughs> well, now Bolden says twenty seventeen appears to be the best and long shot, given that lawmaker, lawmakers are expected to provide no more than one billion for the program in 2016's fiscal year that begins October first, about two hundred and fifty million less than Obama is seeking. The commercial crew program is funding ventures by two private companies, Boeing and SpaceX, to develop a fleet of domestic rockets to resume flying astronauts to the space station. The last space shuttle flight to be orbiting the lab was July 2011. Some key lawmakers have raised concerns about the program, which uses a different contracting program than NASA used for the shuttle. Under commercial crew, NASA pays companies to achieve certain milestones, but leaves details largely to the contractor because it costs less. But the firms get to keep the intellectual property rights of everything they find and all of their products subsequently there, too. And there's a risk that the problem could go undetected until uh, later in the development process as well. Advocates of the arrangement say it means companies can more nimbly and cheaply meet contract targets, but skeptics say there's little oversight and the government has little control over any costs. Bolden wrote in the letter that he hopes funding an agreement can be reached that ends this reliance on Russian rockets. I am asking that we put the disagreements behind us and focus our collective efforts on support for American industry. The Boeing Corporation and SpaceX to complete construction and certification of their new crew vehicles so that we can begin launching our own astronauts from the Space Coast off Florida in 2017, he wrote. Under the contract modification, NASA is buying six Soyuz seats and associated services for calendar year 2018 with rescue and return services extending through late spring 2019, according to an agency spokeswoman. Should the U.S. commercial providers be ready by 2018, the Soyuz launch dates could be adjusted such that the landing could occur later, she said. It's, it's wow, we've got to buy back our own space program. That's <laughs> really, yeah, yeah, way, way to go, uh, former presidents. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, who, who, who let that one happen? Yes. <laughs> well, gang. That is all the time we got for today, of course, on your Coffee and Cigarettes Wednesday Grinder, HTLA Radio 1, New York's best talk. I want to thank you for tuning in and listening today. Uh, Stacy, sorry about the uh, chat room. Call me. You know. <laughs> uh, Louis Lawless, uh, thank you, my friend, for being here every single time. You do a great job. Love having you. Thank you. I got lost. H T. 
L A O H T L A. Hell is that? Well, that's your phone. It's okay. Don't worry. It's about, it's about fucking time. Move on. Move on. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Also, Gilbert, thank you for being here, my friend. Thank you for listening and support the show. For, for the, the love, love of God. God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you go. Now throw those social media links before you go. Don't forget to follow us on our Facebook page. There you go. On Twitter and on Instagram. Thank you very much. <laughs> And to the rest of you out there, go out and have yourselves a great Wednesday Eve. And we will catch you here tomorrow for the Thursday showdown. That's right, the Thursday double-double coffee and cigarettes, 5 p.m. Eastern. As always, be here or be queer. (laughs) (laughs) And we will catch you on the flip side.